I titled this morning's message, The Best is Yet to Come. The best days lie ahead of you, and if you want that to happen, we're going to talk about it this morning, how to ensure that the best days are before you. There's an old saying that says, you're never too late, you're never too old to learn. Now, if you think like me, not only do I think that you're never too late to learn, I think you're never too late You're never too late to win. You're never too late to inherit. There's no such thing as old in the kingdom of God. Caleb, 80 years old when he took his mountain. Moses, 80 years old when he began his ministry. Noah, 120 years old when he began his ministry. Well, we say 120 because that's when he got in the ark, but um, I'm sorry, he preached for 120 years. He was way, way over that. And so what I'm trying to say is we need to move forward. In Psalm 91, 12, it says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. What it means is teach us to think about our days and recognize how few they are and to spend them the way they should. What he's really saying is live every day like it could be your last. Because it could be. And I don't mean that in some kind of reckless abandonment. What it means is live your life every day in the service of the king. Give God your best every day and you, it will be the best time of your life. Someone once said that life is like a dollar bill. You spend it any way you want, but you only get to spend it once. When you spend money, there are really only two things you can do with it. Invest it or waste it. I'm going to say, well, really? Well, what, what about stuff like buying food and clothes? Well, let's invest it. You're investing in your own nourishment. You're investing in your life. So you have two choices. And the same thing goes for life. We can do one of two things. We can invest our life in an incorruptible inheritance that will come, or we can waste it. And so we need to begin to think a little bit differently. It doesn't matter whether you're 6 or 60, healthy or wealthy, puny or poor, you can make the rest of your life the best of your life. It's that simple or that complex, depending on how you want to make it. Now I want you to think for a moment, if you were starting all over, with every, all the knowledge you have right now, you know the difference from right and wrong, you know you're old enough to learn, you're old enough to love, you're old enough to really live. If you could ask the Lord Jesus Christ how to make your life the best life you possibly could have, what do you think he would say? You think you might say Matthew 6.33? I didn't see everybody nod. Does everybody know what Matthew 6.33 says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If I had to summarize that verse, it would be simple. First things first. And I want you to understand that that's the way it is in life. If we want to be successful, it's first things first. How many of you ever put your shoes on before your pants? It doesn't work very well, does it? You're laughing, but it, it doesn't. How many of you ever walked out of the house with your underwear over your pants? Huh? Or none. <laughs> or none. You know, how many of them have that accomplished? It just doesn't happen, right? Unless you're Superman, right? <laughs> But other than that, we don't do it because it's first things first. How many of you put your shirt on or your blouse on or your dress on and then put your deodorant on? <laughs> well, if you got a sleeveless, I guess that works. Okay. But it, 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 all that does is protect your shirt. 
or stand your shirt, depending on what you use. So what am I saying? We need to put first things first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, this morning's message, for those of you who don't like alliteration, I'm sorry, but it is, it is full of alliteration, plagued with alliteration. I did it on purpose, but at probably a little excessive, number one. <laughs> The first thing we do is pursue proper priorities. We need to understand, pursue proper priorities. Everything will rise and fall right here. Everything in your life will be determined right here. Whether or not you put first things first. If your priorities are not in order, your life will not be in order. If your priorities are not right, you won't be right. It is that simple. You don't have to pray about it. <sighs> I can say that. Yes, I did. You do not have to pray about it. Your number one priority in life is simple. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to discuss it. You don't have to come up with a consensus of what the most important thing is. You must simply be obedient to the Word of God. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. I want to take a moment. Let's look at the word seek. It means to actively pursue. To go after. It means in our relationship, in our position as a believer, that it is not passive. We don't sit back and wait for God to move. It's an active process where we are actively pursuing God. We are going after him first and foremost in every area of our life. And I want you to, that's in the present tense. So it doesn't mean I did it once. It is a continuous process in our life. Day in and day out, we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But in order to do that, the first thing you need to do, in order to do that, you need to seek the king first, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because you cannot have a kingdom without a king so our first priority ought to be first and foremost to seek the king of the kingdom. The Christian life is more than just expecting the Lord. It is seeking first the Lord. I want you to understand that the Lord is not something that you just expect or accept. He's someone you actively see. I can tell you something. Without a shadow of a doubt, that your relationship with God at this very moment, whether wonderful or not, I can tell you without even knowing you how much and how good your relationship with God is. I know that sounds brazen. It sounds a little bit arrogant. But I can guarantee you I'm correct. I can look you in the face and be 100% sure of what I'm about to say to you. I know exactly how much of a relationship with God you have. As much as you want as much as you want. God doesn't have any favorites. James chapter 4, verse 8, one of my favorite verses in Scripture. A lot of my favorite verses are found in James. <laughs> no, it's just true. Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. It's really that simple. If you know how close you are with God, it's there. Jeremiah 29, 13. And you shall seek me and find me when you search, when you shall search for me with all your heart. When you, you shall seek me, you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But I want you to know it's not just enough to seek the Lord. You seek him first, but you also seek his kingdom. First means first. It means putting God first in all the areas of your life. 
If you're looking in your Bible, which I don't have open because I wrote it all down, but let me bring it to flip over, flip in there to first uh, Matthew 6, verse 33. And I just want you to underline, circle, highlight, put a star next to whatever, however you mark up your Bible. This isn't my marking up Bible, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Back up just a little bit and look at verse 30. Matthew 6, 30. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is done in the furnace, he will much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Circle that word, faith. In verse 32. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. Circle the word Father. And I want you to understand why I said those things. And then verse 33, circle the word first. The reason I want you to understand those things is because the Bible teaches us without faith it is impossible to please Him. We... When we exercise faith, the Father will give us those things that we have need of if we seek Him first. Do you know what faith is? Faith is putting the Father first. Jesus does not want some, some place in your life. He doesn't want prominence in your life. He wants preeminence in your life. He wants to be the first moments of every day, the first of every week, the first part of every paycheck. He wants to be first. When I say that, I, I need to take a moment and say, even I, I struggle with this a little bit, and I've learned to change. Like, what's the first thing you do when you get a headache? Oh, see, take an aspirin. <laughs> take a Tylenol. Seek him first. I get convicted of this because if I start to get a headache, I, I fall into that and take an aspirin or Tylenol and etc. Uh, I have been battling a great deal that the first thing I do is ask the Lord to meet me. Cause whatever's causing that to go away. Him first. You know, whether it's the, what's the first thing you do when you don't have enough? Enough money, enough food. Call somebody, call a bank, call grandpa, papa, or get on your knees. And ask the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Now, I'm not saying you might not use the food bank to your uncle or your brother or your cousin or the guy down the street you never met. God can use anybody, but it's him first. It's him first. He doesn't want to be vice president. He doesn't want to be co-regent. He wants to be Lord of your life. And if you allow him to do that, the rest of your life shall truly be the best of your life. Not only are we to seek the king, but we seek the kingdom. And I want you to understand, the kingdom means, literally, it means rule or reign of the king in your life. The king has rules. Seek first the kingdom of God and the rule of the reign of God in our entire lives. That's what we need to do. Now, when we truly seek the king, we are automatically going to seek three things. Did she put that up? What's the next one? Okay, no, not yet. So we need to pursue God first. We need to put priorities right. First, things we're going to seek is the glory of God. The second thing is the guidance of the king. And the third thing is the government of the king. Now, what you need to understand is first you seek the glory of God. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Where, whether therefore you eat, you drink, or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Every part and parcel of your life, every minute, every moment of your life, 
and time, every ounce and every pound of your strength, every muscle, every fiber of your being is given for the glory of God. I don't know how you can do Well, how do you do that? Well, Jesus himself said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Every part of your body, heart, mind, soul, and strength. Give it to God. Give him everything you have first, and he will meet you. But give it to the glory of God. Now, a lot of Christians give God the glory for everything. And that's not a bad thing, but they give God the glory for things they never consulted him about. Job choice, new this, new that, what they should do, how they should do it. They just do it and then give God the glory. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's always good to give God the glory. But before you give God the glory, make sure it is what God wanted you to glory in. I heard stories of people who had a chance to get better jobs and God said no. They didn't understand it until the place that they were going to close down and they would have had nothing. Moved to a certain place. Uh, my, I've told this story too many times, but I'll tell it again. Stacy, our daughter in the Lord, was working and felt that God said don't work. And I said, she asked me what I thought of that. And it frightened me. It frightened me every time I tell the story because I was very nonchalant about it. I was watching Star Trek. And everybody was talking around the room. And I I don't know if you call it multitasking or whatever you do. I listen to everything that goes on so because I don't want to be rude. But I'm watching Star Trek and she turns to me and says, Pastor Jim, when when my, my son gets born, should I stay home and take care of him? And I quickly turned my head and said, Is that what your husband can you afford it? I think it's a great thing for mom to be someone to be home with their children if they can do that. Okay? All right. Bye. That was it. <laughs> no good conversation. Gave my opinion. Told her what I thought was the Lord's thing and moved on. <coughs> September 11th or 12th because the 11th she couldn't get through. She called me crying. And I, I was in New York. My immediate response was what happened? Somebody got caught 9-11. No, that wasn't it. She said, I want to thank you for listening to me and giving me that advice. Because that was my office that was blown up. And she gives God the glory. Because of her children and, and the advice. But I look back and go, I better take those things more seriously. <laughs> I believe you're always in the spirit, even if you're watching Star Trek. But I think I would like to have thought a little bit more intensely about it. Let me pray about it. But the truth is, if you this is the other side of it. While it made me nervous, the truth is, if you are in a place in your life where you seek God first, Every morning, every day, in every situation. If you are in a situation where you seek his kingdom and his wisdom on a regular basis, and regular, I, I, I shouldn't say regular because that's the wrong word, on a consistent basis. Because regular is like me. I take a piano lesson once a year. You know what it's got me? Nowhere. I go to the gym. I think about it a lot. Dutch me no, nothing. I want to diet. Doesn't help me at all. But when you do it consistently, you should always carry that anointing. You should always be hosting the Spirit of God in you. And when you do that, someone can say, what should I do? And you don't have to go, wait. Because I want you to know something. Sometimes it will be your only opportunity to give them the gospel, to give them the truth, to give them the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, which He has deposited in you. It might be your only chance. So you can't say, wait. Let me go fast and pray about it. Pastor Tim, now you tell me I shouldn't fast and pray? That's not what I said. What I said was, you should fast and pray first. I may remember the story of Jesus and the apostles. The demoniac boy that they couldn't deliver. Jesus said, this one cometh out, but with much prayer and fasting. Well, the demoniac came to them right then and there. Do you think they, what Jesus was telling them, well, don't try to do anything. Just go fast and pray for a while and then take care. No, what he's saying is you need to be fasted. You need to be prayed up. You need to have sought me first every single day. Then when you have a need, you can call, put a demand on the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will answer you. That's what he's talking about. Seek first the kingdom of God, the glory of the king. Second, we need to ask for his guidance. 
And I gotta tell you, there's two things about the Lord's guidance. First is found here. And a lot of people don't want to listen, that's old, that doesn't apply. I don't want to tell you all the things I've heard. It's here. And I got good news for you. It's always right. It's always right. I was impressed this morning. Two of the people that came up for prayer said they want wisdom. That's exactly what it says. God says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask the Lord who giveth to all men. And I want you to know that I love the next word, liberally. Gives you all you ask for, all you can handle, all that you need. Not a little bit. And he doesn't take it back once you ask. So you ask him for wisdom in life situations. You ask for the guidance of the king. Lord, what would you have me to do? And the third thing it means we seek the government of the king. Loyal kingdom, I'm sorry, loyal citizens ask for the kingdom principles. They want to be governed and controlled by the king. He wants to be the ruler and the sovereign in their life, not some co-pilot, not something else. He, the greatest thing we have is when we understand that the greatest liberty that we can have is to be under the control of the master. We do anything we want, but we submit to the king of kings. Proper priorities. Now this next one, people always, I don't know, go, pop. Pursue personal purity. And every time I talk about this, that big ugly L word comes up. Anybody know what it is? Legalism. It's neither an ugly word, and it's not always accurate. Pursuing personal purity, uh, like I said, they're all alliterations. It could say pursue personal righteousness. <coughs> Excuse me. Not only do we seek his kingdom, but we seek his righteousness. That means we are seeking for God and the power of his Holy Spirit to have his control over us. We're not only that, we are seeking God's character within us. It's not that we just want to seek first the kingdom. We want his rule over us. We want his character developed in us. We want to seek his righteousness. The king would, I'm sorry, the kingdom of God is not only inwardly experienced, it's outwardly expressed. I read a quote, and I, I don't remember where it was, but I'm just going to tell you. Faith is always seen by its fruit. Character is always seen by its conduct. Proverbs 20.12 says, the hearing ear, the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. When we think of this, we see that when we seek the kingdom, people ought to be able to, be able to see the kingdom in us. I read a quote of um, Nietzsche. Anybody know who he was? Okay, he was a German philosopher. He was, um, he was a philosophical founder of the Nazi movement in Germany. He was the first man in history to say, to come to the conclusion that God is dead. He came to that conclusion by looking at Christianity. Do you know what he said about Christians? This is, this is a direct quote. If you want me to believe in your Redeemer, you're going to have to look a little more like the redeemed. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Do you know what Gandhi said? I would believe in Christianity if it weren't for Christians. Wow. <laughs> How about a slap in the face that is, huh? The mark of a Christian is that he makes it easier for others to believe in God. What does it mean to seek the righteousness of God? We must desire it. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I talk to people all the time, Christians, and for whatever reason, I am... This idea of, of desiring God's righteousness first, God's purity in us, 
it, it's always, I always get, well, that's because you're the pastor. That's your call of God in your life. That, that's the way. That, I want you to understand something. When it comes to seeking first the kingdom of God, when it comes to hunger and thirsting after righteousness, that's not just my call. Or Pastor Barbara's call. Or any of the ministry staff. That's not just their call. That's all of our call. To seek His righteousness. To hunger and thirst. Now, how many of you have ever really been hungry? Okay. I mean really hungry. I know, I know what it is to be really hungry. I fasted 40 days. Many of you have fasted for a long period of time and gone without food. Some of you did it. I'm sure my daughter felt it recently. She was in the hospital for seven days. They wouldn't give her food. Now, she doesn't eat much, but when you don't eat much and you don't have any, you are really, really hungry. Right? To me, uh, you know, at the middle of the day, at lunchtime, I feel hungry. But if I compare how I feel at lunchtime as I did at day 39 of my fast, I'm not, you know, it's not even on the same page. And was be an and thirsty. Ever been so thirsty? You just actually, I want you to understand something. Hunger. What do you think is greater, hunger or thirst? Yes. Thirst. It's a greater desire. And the, the idea, I want you to understand, hunger is nourishment, but thirst is life. You cannot live without water. You can live up to 90 days without food. Most people. The average person can't live seven days without water. Wow. So, not only do you hunger, you want desire, but you thirst. It's a deep, intimate desire for God. And so, because of that, that's what it is to pursue personal righteousness or personal purity. To desire God's presence as much as you would desire food or water in your life. And I'm going to tell you something. Here's something that I find very, very interesting. If you do that first, you may need less food. Did you know that? If the desire for God's presence, the Word of God, the bread of life, is so great, you may need less food. Jesus himself said, man shall not live by bread alone. In my own life, I witnessed that in one of my long fasts where in the middle of the day I would go home and commune with God and pray and read because I would not be... Now, the funny thing is this. If I didn't do that, now why I wouldn't is beyond me, but it happened. When I, when I went home and I put on, I have this CD called Invitation and it's just a real quiet worship thing and I would lay in the bed and worship and read my Bible and it would be great. I'd be able to go to work at night and I'd be okay. If I didn't do that, she would... Pastor Gail would send me home because people were worried that I was dying. I couldn't get whole sentences out. I couldn't get whole thoughts out. I, I didn't even look good. And the difference was, if I was so busy during the day I came home, I jumped, changed my other clothes and went right to the studio to work. I didn't feed myself the Word of God. Uh, and so I learned a little bit. I'm, by no means do I think I understand it, but I learned a little bit what it means. The man shall not live by bread alone. We need to desire it so much. We need to <coughs> derive it. Let me read the verse for you. For he had made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be able to be the righteousness of God. God is not interested in our righteousness. He's only interested in his righteousness. He's not interested in what you can do for him. He's interested in what he can do through you. Do you understand the difference? Righteousness. Now, I want you to understand something. When we read, <laughs> when we read the verse, Paul says that he knew no sin that made righteousness of God in him. Now, I want you to understand what that means. First and foremost, we cannot obtain righteousness. It has to first be imputed to us. So before we can ever develop and derive righteousness in us, we need to first have it imputed to us.
You understand what I mean? It means that God has to give it to us first. That's exactly what Jesus came to do. But from that point on, it's now up to us to practice, to pursue righteousness. And we must depict it. We ought to live the kingdom like kingdom subject. Will Rogers said it this way. We ought to live in such a way that we would not be ashamed to sell our family portrait. I'm sorry, sell the family parrot to the town gossip. <laughs> right? Right? And don't take a little thought there. That is, we, our life needs to depict it in such a way that we are not ashamed of who we are and what we say behind closed doors. Because see, if you're truly seeking personal purity, you're the same everywhere, all the time. Now that's one of the things that my wife loves about me and can't stand about me. Because I'm the same everywhere. No, ask her, I'm the same everywhere. Which means, when if I all my great qualities I show to everybody, but all the ones that aren't so good, Given the right circumstances, you could see those too. I am the same everywhere. And if I make a mistake, I apologize and simply say, we all know I'm not perfect. We all know you're not perfect. God is working in us all. Amen? But the point is that we need to desire personal purity. We need to pursue it. We need to desire in us to be righteous. Not because we can do it, it's first given to us, it's imputed to us by Jesus Christ, but now we need to live a life that follows kingdom rules and kingdom authority. And the last one for this morning is we need to perceive the promised prosperity. Ooh. Perceive the promised prosperity. All these things will be added unto you. Now, if you look back to what the AR is simple, it says drink, eat, meat for the body, clothes, um, all those things will be added unto you. Jesus in verse 27 says, think of, how, which of you can think about it and add one inch to your height? I wish I could, I'd add three. Because it seems everything I do is just three inches out of reach. Only problem with that is, I think if I added three inches, everything would still be, the other things I want to do would just be out of reach. I worked for a guy, I'll never forget, do you, ever, you know how the, anybody lay sheetrock? Anybody do that? I'm short, so it's a real problem for me to put up ceilings. And I have to put a corner up, put a brace up over here, climb a ladder, do it. I had a boss that went like this. Hey, hey, put a couple of screws up, will you? I go, gee, that's, that's the height to be to do that. His, his reach was over nine, he was six, six or six, three. He reached up, held the, held the boards up while I screwed them up. We were a great team, but it didn't work for me when I was alone. You have to stick it in the corner, pry it up, crank it up if you're, if you're really good. Then you got to get up the ladder fast enough before anything shifts or moves. And it was just not good. But I, no matter how much I thought about it, no matter how much I tried, I could never gain one inch of height. And that's what Jesus is saying. Don't worry about those things. People worry about things about those kinds of things. Not God. God will give it to us. For all these things that the Gentiles seek, and your heavenly Father knows it, verse 32, knows of what you have need of, and he promised that if you seek first the kingdom of God, you will have all the things that you need. Now, here's the problem is. Can everybody spell need for me? Are you ready? Let's all do it together. W, no, come on, let's do it together. N-N-E-D. Oh, 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 it's not W-A-N-T? Oh, it's N E E. Oh, that's it. The problem is many of us spell the word need W A N T. He doesn't promise to give you everything you want. And I know there are a lot of ministries out there that will tell you, God will give you everything you want. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's absolutely true if you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because you know why it's true? That God will give you everything you want if you seek him first. If he's at the top of your list in the morning. If he's at the top of the list when you get your paycheck. If he's at the top of the list when you have a stress or problem. If he's at the top of the list. Do you know why you will get everything you want? Because what you want will be what he wants to give you. How's that, huh? 
But the problem is, sometimes we want things that aren't right for us, that he doesn't want to give us. I am convinced that there are four lessons that we ought to teach our children as early as we possibly can. And some of us as adults need to relearn them. Now, I believe my girls got this really early in life. First of all, you don't need everything you want. You don't. I'm much older now, but I wish, I wish that I had all the money I had ever spent on things that I wanted but didn't really need. I could retire. I wasn't as wise in my 20s as I am now. The second lesson, lesson that they learn is you don't really want everything you need. I'm sorry, you, you don't want everything you need. I never wanted a single spanking growing up. I can't remember once. Now, I have to tell you, I am blessed with a child that is, was just absolutely wonderful because she knew when she needed the spanking and she pushed until she got it. Yeah. <laughs> she was smart. She said, I wanted it. And I thought, I'll never forget. My in-laws were coming and she did something. And, uh, and I hope she doesn't mind that I don't embarrass her. But um, whatever happened is my father came out of me. You disciplined the area that did the crime. Now, I didn't punch her, but I slapped her across the face. My mother-in-law jumped out of the chair. She's screaming at me, oh, I'm going to call the police on you. And my daughter turns to her and says, I've been waiting for that. Leave him alone. I said, well, next time, tell me. I'd be happy to do it sooner. <laughs> but understand, we don't always want what we need. Sometimes we, I hate to say this, sometimes we need a little adversity to understand a little perseverance. If you've never had the adversity, you will not ever understand perseverance. That's why you watch, um, oh good. <laughs> I have a clock on there this time. I want to make sure I stay a certain amount of time. Otherwise, I never would. <laughs> ever meet somebody that's wealthy and everything given to them? And then when they don't get it, you know what happens? <laughs> I will never forget. God is my witness as long as I live. We had a customer whose son came home from the military and mom bought him a BM mom bought him a BMW. How many like mom to buy you a BMW? He was ticked off. Because it was used. Two years old. I was there and I looked at the woman and I said you want to me? <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy with a two-year-old here. I'm not going to complain at all. But see, you don't always need everything you want. And the third lesson is God doesn't give you everything you want. And sometimes I'm so glad of that because the greatest blessings I found are the things that he doesn't give us. I read this um, in my studies. This is a confession of an unknown Confederate soldier. And I just want to read it to you. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. He made me weak, and I'm sorry, I was made weak that I might learn to be humble and to obey. I asked God for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that he might do better things. I asked God for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty so that I might be wise. I asked God for the power that I might have to to, I'm sorry, that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I hoped for, almost despite myself. My unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most blessed. That's the fourth lesson. God gives us what we need. I read a story of two stores who keep competing with one another. And one guy 
put a sign up out on the front of a store and it said, if you want it, we have it. Well, there's such strict competition against these two stores, you know, right across the street from another. The other manager went back in the store and I, he thought for a while and he thought for a while and he thought for a while and he came back out and he put a sign up. If we don't have it, you don't need it. And that's kind of what it is. God gives us what we need. If God doesn't give it to you at this point in your life, you probably don't need it. See, what the Lord is trying to teach us here is that it's, his, it's our job to serve Him and it's His job to supply us. Most people have it backwards. Most people think it's our job to supply and God's job to serve us. If they had their own way, now some of you will know this hymn and some of you won't, but if they had it their way, this is what the words of the sin, the old hymn would say. I wish... I'm trying, give me a minute because I'm trying to sing it. i got to remember the tune. Yes. yes. Have, my, own way. have my own way, Lord. Have, have my own, own way. way. I'll be the potter. You be the clay. I'll mold and make you after my will. While you are waiting, yielded and still. Now, those of you who know the song, my wife was helping out here, is have thy own way, not have my own way. But many of us, many Christians would do that. And I have to tell you, there's an entire segment of Christianity that wants to do that to God. Well, I pray God must give it to me. Wrong! He wants to give us all good. And every, every good and perfect thing coming down from the Father life. He wants us to be blessed and prosperous. He wants us to have help. But he doesn't have to give us anything. James, I, I, again, back to James. I'm, the reason you're going to hear a lot about James is we're studying James on Thursday nights now, starting this week. So I've been reading through it. James says, you have not because you ask not. Or, or because you ask a miss. Do you know what a miss means? Selfishly, not according to his will, not according to his word. That's what it is. It's to ask for something that God won't give you because it's not according to his will. But if you pray according to his will and don't doubt, Jesus says you'll get it all. It's exactly that kind of attitude that cuts the blessing from God. When we try to dictate to God what we want. In a real sense, we've been called to live. You ready? We've been called to live hand to mouth. Did you know that? God's hand to our mouth. <laughs> Why? Well, I can't think of a better way to live. He'll give us all that we need and all that we desire according to His will. I read a story of a missionary who was heading on a trip to overseas and he got on a boat. As he's, as, as he's walking up the gangplank, a wealthy friend came to him and gave him a sealed envelope. And he said this, take this envelope with you. And if at any time while you're overseas you come to a place where you have exhausted every other possibility and you have nowhere else to turn, you have you have a need that you cannot be any other way, open the envelope. Well, the missionary said, thank you. He took the envelope and put it in his pocket. Well, he went up the gangplank, he went on the mission field, he spent 20 years on the mission field. At the end of the 20 years, he came back and walked down the gangplank. His wealthy friend was there and there for him again. He reached into his pocket and he returned the envelope and gave it back to him, still unopened, and said, never once that I come to a place where I did not know where to turn, know what to do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you'll never come to that place. If you want to make the rest of your life the best of your life, allow Jesus Christ to be Lord, put him first, live every moment for him, and he'll take care of the rest. Let's all stand and we'll close in prayer this morning. And those of you who are keeping track, I went 43 minutes and 59 seconds. 
I'm not a legalist, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Say that again. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, as we gather together with one heart and one voice this morning, let the cry of our heart be, Lord, I want to know you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to put Jesus Christ his, and his kingdom first in our life. Help us to allow the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in us, to mold and shape our character, that it might be evident that we belong to Christ. Let that phrase, Christ first, Christ first, Christ first, echo in our minds and in our hearts that we would consider Christ first in everything we say, in everything we do, in every decision we make, in every word that comes out of our mouth, Christ first. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.